Chapter 6 of Between the Larch Woods and the Weir. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. Between the Larch Woods and the Weir by Flora Clickman. Chapter 6 Dwellers in the Flower Patch. February on our hills may be anything, from September round to May. Sometimes it is mild and sunny and sweet, with the scent of newly turned earth. Or it may be bitingly cold, and very bleak in the exposed parts, with a shiveriness even in the valleys. You just take your chance, sure at least of fresh air, peace, and the birds. That is one of the perennial joys of the place. Summer or winter, you know there will be a host of little fluttering things, all ready to welcome you as a friend, if you will but show the least bit of friendliness towards them. Not that their greeting is entirely cordial when you arrive. The starlings are probably the first to see you. They are arrant busybodies, and seem to spend most of their time retailing gossip from the ridge of the red-tiled roof. No wonder their nests are the lazy makeshifts they are. A perfect scandal to the bird world, Mrs. Misselthrush has told me. It's a wonder the sanitary authorities don't insist on their being pulled down and rebuilt. Anything, stuffed in anywhere, a handful of straw in the chimney, dried grass and oddments of rubbish collected in a corner under the tiles. You wouldn't think any self-respecting egg would consent to be hatched out in such a nest. Certainly no young thrush would put up with so disreputable a nursery. But then, as we all know, the thrushes come of very good family, whereas the starlings... Well, not that one would say a word against one's neighbours, but since everyone can see and hear it for themselves, the starlings are simply impossible. But the starlings don't seem to be the least bit worried by the cold shoulder of the more exclusive residents. They gabble and bawl the whole day long, from the top of the roof, while the one who has managed to secure the apex of the weathercock is positively insulting. And the moment we turn into the little white gate, they begin. See who's down there? I say, everybody look. There's that wretched white dog again. Remember what a perfect nuisance he was last August when we just got the youngsters out of the nest. We were afraid every moment lest he would start to climb the trees like their old cat used to. Hi there, you on the barn roof. Have you heard the news? Shriek, shriek, chatter, chatter, chatter. So they go on for hours at a time. Then Policeman Robin arrives. What's all this noise about? He demands from the post of the gate leading into the upper orchard. Oh, goodness gracious, it's that horrid white dog again. Nearly shoved his nose right into our nest in the woodruff bank last year. Chit, chit, chit. But don't you worry, my dear. This to the lady he has just married. I'll drive him away. You can trust to me. And he flicks his conceited little tail and flies to the top of a tree stump nearby, still calling out his in severe reprimand. Next, the blackbird, hunting for a little fresh meat among the grey, mossed-over stones that edge the garden beds, raises his head and cranes his neck above the overhanging heartsease trails and the foliage of the pinks to see what the commotion is all about. I say, Martha, to the demure body in brown, who has been meekly tracking along behind him, there's that terror of a dog again. Recollect when he was here last year? Never a chance to enjoy a snail in peace. Before you'd given the shell more than one tap on the stone, down he'd rush. Here he comes now. Slip along quick to the laurels. I say, that was a near shave. Chuck, 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 go away. What business have you to come here disturbing respectable old inhabitants like us? And so the hubbub continues, while the small white dog with the brown ears trots in a business-like manner all over the place, making sure that every cornerstone, 
and bush and gatepost is just where he left it last time. And having ascertained that the universe is still intact, he sets off to a particular spot in the lower orchard, sniffs about till he finds the identical tuft of grass he is searching for, whereupon he eats and eats at the long green blades, much in the same way as we fall on the young lettuces or the black currants, or whatever else may be in season when we come down. Though why this particular tuft of grass should be the only one he selects out of the acres and acres at his disposal is always a mystery to us. Yet he never forgets it, straight for that small patch in the middle of the big orchard he makes, once he has done his tour of inspection round the estate. Before I have been in the house half an hour, I start making overtures to the birds, and they immediately respond. I proceed by way of the bird board. This may need explanation. Outside one of the living room windows, I have established a board that projects about a foot beyond the wide window ledge. At first I had it resting on the window ledge, but I found that the birds were down out of sight when they came up to feed, hidden by the sash and window frame. Therefore I had it raised to bring it exactly on a level with the glass. It is fixed securely on supports so that it won't blow away. Neither would a flock of jays and wood pigeons overbalance it. A couple of stout bits of tree branches have been fixed upright at the sides. These are very popular as they make the board look less bare, more tree-like and familiar to the birds. They love to alight on a branch before going down to feed and they often return to the branch when they have eaten their fill, sourcing their relations and daring them to touch a morsel of the food which each bird seems to consider its own exclusive property. Strips of narrow lath have been nailed to the outside edges of the board, projecting about an inch above the level of the board. This wooden rim saves the food from rolling off or blowing away too easily. It also gives the birds a little perch that they love to stand on while they run their eyes over the menu. On this board, in times of plenty, go crumbs, seed, rolled oats, maize, peas, little bits of fat or suet, anything in fact that birds will eat. And if the weather be cold, a lump of suet will be lashed to each branch for the tits to peck at, with occasional bunches of bacon rind, hanging like tassels. In wartime the birds just have to take what they can get. Within 24 hours of our arrival, the birds have rediscovered their food board and over they come from garden and adjoining orchards and woods with such a whirring of wings, directly they hear the window being opened. In the apple tree, in the laburnum tree, in the damson tree they wait. And the moment I move away from the window, down they pounce and such a squabbling and chatter and succession of arguments takes place. In a few days' time, as they get more used to me, they flutter down before I have even spread out their meal, perching on the edge of the board and eyeing me with the most audacious nerve. The robin is positively impudent in his demand that I should hurry up. And it is not longer than a week before they come hopping right into the room, hunting all over the breakfast table if the window be left open and I have not been down sufficiently early to meet their requirements. If the days are cold, and outside food scarce, they tap the window sharply with their beaks, to call attention to their needs, while plaintive, appealing little faces look anxiously at me. And, oh, they are such a pretty little crowd! One has no idea what clear, beautifully bright colours our British birds can show, unless one has seen them right away from the taint of smoke and grime. Town environments, be they ever so rural, are always reminiscent of the chimneys in the distance, or the railways that cut them up. But on these hills, where cottage chimneys are very few and far between, and what smoke there is, is usually wood smoke, some of the birds are exceedingly lovely. 
there is the great tit, brilliantly yellow as a daffodil, with an admixture of black velvet and pure white. He and his wife quite take your breath away as they splash down, out of space, and flitter about among the sober thrushes and darker blackbirds. And when, in the summer, they bring their babies along with them, I don't think there is a prettier sight in creation than the little bluey-grey balls of fluff that peck daintily at the bits of suet, and then hiss vigorously and scold at the big wasps that come and steal it from under their very beaks. So tame and innocent of fear they are, that they come into the room whenever the window is left open, and mother and father follow them quite as trustfully. Then again, we all think we know the blue tit, but when you see him in the wilds, he is a very different-looking morsel from the dirty blue apology you meet nearer town. On the bird board, he is almost metallic in the brightness of his blue-green feathers and the lovely tint of yellow. He raises his crest feathers with pleasure when he sees the suet on the branch, and over the little acrobat goes, hanging head downwards or clinging with one tiny claw to a piece of twig. It is all one to him. He swings about like a bright enamel pendant. The male chaffinch is another very gay little fellow, with his warm red and pretty blue and yellow. He calls, spink, spink, in clear penetrating notes, as he lands on the board. And up comes his wife, one of the most shapely and elegant of all the small birds, with the dearest little face. Mr. and Mrs. Bullfinch invariably come together, unless she is detained at home with the family. They perch on the edge of the drinking saucer, side by side, like a pair of solemn paroquets. He, very beautiful in crimson and black velvet, she, decidedly more homely and nondescript. But I can't go through the whole list, there is such a crowd, including a little flock of eight goldfinches that for two winters have always been about the garden together. Jays, with their handsome wing feathers and ugly, very ugly mouths, swoop down continually, scaring the small birds to vanishing point and gobbling up the food by the shovelful. Magpies in plenty perch on the garden rails, but only once has one come to the board when I have been there, and then he got his tail so mixed up with the decorative branches that he had the fright of his life and never repeated the adventure. Wood pigeons are regular in their attendance, when other food is scarce. Oh, certainly, I know all that is to be said on the subject of encouraging wood pigeons. But have you ever studied the peacock and wine colour gleam on their necks when unsmirched by smoke or grime? If so, you will understand my admiration for them. And, in any case, ours isn't a farming area. There is no corn here for them to squander and although they sigh all the summer long in the fir trees, take two pears, Tommy, take two pears, Tommy, do! There are very few pears available that Tommy would even look at. Most that grow in the orchards around are the harsh bitter variety used for making the drink known as perry, the pear equivalent of apple cider. The wood pigeons have helped me back to health and strength many a time with their soft crooning in the larches, and their quiet talk of things above the petty strife and noisy clamour of the struggling marketplace. Therefore, I don't say them nay, in times of plenty, if I have a little to spare, and they chance to need it. Of all the bird family, however, I think the coal tits are our favourites, and there are such a quantity of them. Coal tits always abound in the neighbourhood of larch woods and birches, which accounts for the numbers that dart about my garden. There are birch woods lower down the hill below the cottage, as well as the larch woods up above, and both birch and larch cluster thick down one side of the house to shield it from the cold winds. Though the coal tit is not brightly coloured, like its relations, there is something very delightful about his soft grey garb and his black head with its light grey or nearly white streak down the back. 
Like the robin, he always looks well tailored, not a feather out of place, not a draggled filament anywhere. And he is so extraordinarily alert. He doesn't seem to give himself time to fly. He darts and dives and flits all over the place, and seems to have an appetite proportionately equal to that of the proverbial alderman. Down he dives the minute the food appears. He stands very erect on his slim little legs, no squatting down on his breastbone as the sparrows and even the chaffinches often do. He cocks his head from side to side, promptly decides on the largest lump of fat he can find, seizes it and flies up into a big fir tree where, apparently, he bolts the whole lump instantaneously. At any rate, before you have time to see where he alighted, down he dives, seizes another big piece, and off he goes again. He seems to eat twice his own size in suet in a few minutes. But I conclude he must drop some of it, though I've never been able to prove it. And the theory of a nest full of hungry beaks doesn't always explain his voraciousness, for he disposes of just as much in the winter as in nesting time. Yet, in spite of his appetite, we love him, for he is so tiny and so wonderfully alert. One marvels how so much energy can be boxed up in such a small body. Visitors, who have never had much to do with birds at close quarters, and the birds may be said to be part of the family at this cottage, for they live with us and meal with us, are usually surprised at the differences and the distinctiveness of their various personalities. The robin not only adopts you at once, but he proceeds to supervise your every action and installs himself as your personal attendant. Probably this is all the more emphasised by the fact that he will not allow any rival to encroach on his particular territory. Most birds seem to peg out a claim at the beginning of the season and to resent, more or less, the intrusion of any other of its own kind. Swallows and sparrows and rooks and a few others build in colonies, but the majority of birds seem to prefer a little domain each to himself, wife and family, and you will find one pair of blackbirds driving another from the laurel bush they have chosen, or chasing strangers from the particular garden path they call their own. Though starlings feed and chatter in flocks, one particular pair of starlings make it their business to oust any other starling that they find on the bird board. But the robin can be a perfect terror in the way he seeks to domineer over the whole earth. It is a very large area that he marks off for his individual own, and woe betide any other robin who tries to defy him, unless he be the stronger of the two. One of our robins killed his own wife. We conclude, as she disappeared, after a series of thrashings he gave her daily, and then he injured the wing of one of his own youngsters, because we had petted them and given them food inside the living room. The father used to hide behind a stone down on the garden bed, and watch as his family, the mother and two babies, nervously and timidly approached the bird board, looking round anxiously lest father should see. Then. When they started to feed, he would hiss out the dreadfulest of wicked words at them and fling himself on them, bashing them with his beak, a positive little fury. So one day I put some food on the table inside the room and the downtrodden ones hopped in. I shut the window before the irate father could follow them. He seemed demented with rage when he saw them feeding and couldn't get at them. He literally stamped his foot and viciously tossed off all the pieces of food that were on the board, flinging them to the ground in a most highly glazed specimen of temper. I let the family out by a side window instead of the bird board window, and they evaded their loving and affectionate relative for a little while. But he found them at last and went for his wife, while the children cheeped forlornly among the pansies in the border. We never saw her again, poor, plucky little soul, 
and one of the youngsters dragged a broken wing along the path next day, explaining to me pitifully that he couldn't possibly get up to the bird board now, neither could he find mother anywhere. I took him in and tried to save his life, but it was no use. With all our knowledge and skill and discoveries and training, what clumsy, inadequate creatures we are in comparison with a little mother bird. Less harrowing was the incident of a robin who, on one occasion, came inside, in order to get more than his share of provender if possible, when he was suddenly startled by the dog running into the room. Instead of flying through the window that was open, he made for a closed one, banging his head with such force against the glass that the blow stunned him, and he fell senseless to the ground. I picked him up and tried all the restoratives I could think of, a drop of water on his beak, a cold splash on his head, but to no purpose. He lay just a tiny handful of beautiful feathers in my hand, so light, so helpless, so altogether pathetic. It hurt me badly to gaze at the small mite that only the minute before had been talking to me and cheeking me and liking me. Yes, I'm sure he did. And I am able now to do a thing to bring back the gaiety and life and sparkle to the poor still body. I felt sure he was dead, yet to give him every chance I placed him in a nest of soft flannel out on the window ledge. The day was warm, but there was a breeze that might perhaps revive him. And as a last offering, one does so try to do all one can, I put a tempting piece of suet near his inanimate beak, and how unnatural it seemed to see that suet remain untouched in his vicinity. I took my work and sat where I could see if he so much as stirred a claw. But for a quarter of an hour there wasn't the slightest sign of movement, except when the wind gently ruffled his feathers. And how exquisite they were, the blue so unlike the ordinary blue, the red much more red than the London robins, and the bronze brown so glinting. At last I decided it was useless to watch any longer, for his eyelids had never so much as flickered. I was folding up my work when a big yellow tit flew onto the window ledge, hopped over inquiringly to the suet, and started to sample it. In an instant, up jumped the corpse, and with an angry chick chick, hurled himself at the interloper, and the last I saw of him was chasing the yellow tit all across the garden. Don't ask me to explain. I'm only telling you what happened under my own eyes. Yes, Robin Pear can be a villain. He can also be the extreme reverse. Like the majority of the rest of us, he shows to the most amiable advantage when there is no rival to distract public admiration. So long as he is the centre, as well as the beginning and the end of the bird universe, he is sweetness itself. No other bird is so keenly alive to all my comings and goings. It doesn't matter how fully occupied he may be with the settlement of every other bird's affairs, I have but to go up the garden with fork or spade or broom, and before I have turned half a dozen clods or pulled out a handful of weeds, I am conscious of a soft streak through the air, though I hardly see it. There he sits on a low branch of a currant bush, close to my hand, or stands motionless on an edging stone at my very feet. If I take no notice of him, in all probability he starts a whisper song to call attention to himself. Have you ever heard this? It suggests nothing so much as Elfland music. I know no song exactly like it. You seem to hear a bird warbling most delightfully, but it is far, far away. You raise your eyes and scan the trees around, but no singing bird can you discover. You decide it must be farther off, but what a haunting charm there is about it. Then it ceases. Mr. Robin is hoping that you have understood what he has been saying. But no, the obtuse human just goes on weeding the path as before. So the whisper song starts again. 
this time you think it resembles a very mellow musical box shut up in some distant room suddenly you see him singing straight at you so close to your hand that it gives you quite an uncanny feeling for the moment and you wonder who is he what is he that he should be saying all this to me obviously to me and to no one else but me robin doesn't encourage you in daydreams however he means business and once he sees that he has secured your undivided attention he discards the whisper song and comes to the point down on to the path he drops seizes an unwary worm that your energy has brought to light then tosses it over scornfully and flirts a contemptuous tail which says as plainly as any tail that was ever told is that the best worm you can offer a gentleman poof he eats it nevertheless and so he follows me round the place i never garden alone if at first i cannot see him i whistle a quiet call invariably i hear the whisper song in response and there he is waiting watching missing nothing with his tiny throat feathers vibrating and quivering as he strives to let me into birdland secrets and tells me lots and lots of wonderful things that as yet i'm too dull-witted to understand then there are the blackbirds for individuality they are hard to beat though i admit they are always reproving someone or something with their chatter chut chut i never knew a bird with as many grudges and grievances as augustus seems to have he chut chuts at me if i'm late with his breakfast at abigail when she ventures to gather a few raspberries at the dog whenever he sees him at the little colt for scampering down the meadow at the cuckoo when his voice breaks i've heard him get up after all the family had gone to bed and roundly abuse a poor july cuckoo who had developed a bad stutter and every night about sundown he admonishes the world in general from his pulpit in a pine despite the fact that martha has put the children to bed and is trying to get them to sleep and that every other masculine blackbird for acres around is discoursing on the same subject but the poor thing has had his troubles the first time we really distinguished augustus and martha who monopolize my bedroom window ledge and the pinks and pansy border from claude and juliet who patronize the biggest mountain ash and consider the white and red currants and the snails in the snapdragon bed their particular perquisites was when the former that means augustus and martha you know built in the old plum tree that hangs partly over the green and gold grotto though it has plenty of snowy white flowers on its dark stems in the spring it has been too neglected to produce much fruit but it makes up in flowering ivy and heavenly scented honeysuckle for any other deficiencies and it was in this tangled mass of loveliness that augustus and martha first set up housekeeping augustus being always recognizable by reason of one grave feather they chose it with much circumspection martha with an eye to the easy building facilities offered by strands of tough woodbine and sturdy ivy cables combined with stout plum branches augustus with his main eye focused on the bird board and the other on the accessibility of the bird bath originally a sheep trough hollowed out of a block of rough stone over which moss and small ivy are now trailing altogether it was a most desirable sight for a young couple they were in full view of the side window in the living room and we watched them flying in and out to and fro with beaks laden with grass and straw and similar materials for household decorations later on when two youngsters were hatched there were the same endless journeyings the same loaded beaks but here augustus's perspicacity stood him in good stead it was a very short flight from the plum tree down to the bird board and the pair must have nearly worn the air out judging by the number of times they made the trip the tragedy happened when the youngsters were nearly ready to leave the nest 
and the sad part of it was that we saw it all enacted before our eyes, and yet were powerless to prevent it. We had just sat down to our midday meal. The day seemed all blue sky and bright flowers and gladdening sunshine, the very last day one ought to have met trouble. Augustus had gone off to give Claude a piece of his mind that must have been owing for some time, judging by the heat and length of his harangue. Martha was gathering up the biggest mouthful she could manage, and it is astonishing how they will collect several pieces of bread, a piece of fat, and a flake of oatmeal, packing it up securely in their beak in order to carry it safely. I saw a big bird swoop down onto the branch beside the nest. But big birds are so plentiful with us, it conveyed nothing out of the ordinary to me. It looked like a shrike, but I couldn't be certain. Everything happened so quickly. It seized one of the little ones, killed it outright with one vicious toss, while the other baby called out in wild terror. In far less time than it takes me to write this, the whole air seemed teeming with screaming blackbirds, dozens of them. They went for the murderer, trying to attack him with their beaks, but he flew off into the woods, followed by a crowd of threatening and bewailing birds. One could hear them in the distance when they were no longer in sight. Of course, we had all rushed out into the garden, but we could do nothing. The nest was too high up to be reached without a ladder. Then an unusual silence fell over the garden, the majority of the birds having joined the crowd of pursuers. It is strange how we all bury our hatchets in face of a common danger. It seemed almost death-like for the moment, till, from the top of a larch, a chaffinch bubbled forth. At least there was one happy bird left. Then I bethought me about baby blackbird number two. The villain had only carried off one. We got a ladder, but no bird was in the nest. We decided it must have fallen out in the scrimmage, and searched carefully. After a while we found it, helpless and terrified among the ferns, just where it had fallen, in the grotto. As it didn't seem able to walk or fly, we left it there, and sat down to watch events. Back came poor Martha presently. She looked in the nest, then flew distractedly about. But I suppose the baby was too dazed with fright to do a thing. At any rate, it never uttered a sound or call, and the distressed mother flew off again to the woods on her hopeless quest. We remained on watch the whole afternoon and evening, but neither parent returned. Then I began to get anxious. I put a little food near the frightened, crouching thing, but it took no notice. Only once it gave a piteous cry. How I wished it would keep it up! That at least would surely reach the mother in time. But it didn't repeat the call. At last we had to go in, because it was getting dark, and every bird but our poor little baby was safely in bed. We tried to console ourselves by saying that it would probably be all right and it was wonderful how birds survived all sorts of dangers. But, all the same, we none of us believed we should ever see him again, and we shook our heads silently next morning, when we found an empty space under the ferns, where we had left him overnight. During the day, my suspicions were aroused by the fact that Augustus returned again and again to the bird board, and stuffed his beak full of provender, which he carried off in the good old way, but the moment I tried to follow him, he merely went into a nearby tree and tried to say tut tut with his mouthful. It took me all the afternoon and used up all the stealth and cautiousness I possess to track him. He would not fly any more than he could help. He kept right down on the ground, running along with his head slightly lowered, keeping close to the shadow of the wall, slipping under hedges and low growths, always looking about from side to side, standing stock still when he scented danger. In this way he got up the hill and right across a field to where a big Wellingtonia stands like a pyramid against a stone wall, its outspreading branches drooping protectingly and hiding all sorts of secrets in its dark green depths. 
Behold, there was Martha, anxiously waiting on the doorstep, so to speak, for Augustus to return. She was as cautious in her movements as he was, but she couldn't help uttering a low, chuck, chuck, pleasure, when she saw his beak so crammed with good things. Both slipped in under the lowest branch. I bided my time. I didn't want to add one single extra anxiety to the little mother heart that was already so burdened with care. But when at length I saw both birds slink off in search of food, I parted the branches and looked in. For some time I could see nothing. It was so dark and mysterious under the heavily plumed boughs. But the little one had learned to use its voice by now. Cheep! came vigorously from within. And then I saw our baby, comfortably ensconced on a drift of pine needles against the wall. I slipped away quietly, wondering and wondering how in the world those little birds had managed to get that fat youngster up that hill and into the tree that was fully three minutes' walk, even for me, from the old nest. The baby flourished apace, and before we returned to town it was brought along to the pansy border, and told to stay there quite still for a moment, while Mother got it something to eat. But it didn't do anything of the sort. Directly her back was turned, it hopped into the bird's bath, and splashed joyously till its expostulating parents returned, alarmed out of their senses, lest it should be drowned. After thinking it over, I fancy that for all round serviceability you cannot do better than the blackbird. He starts singing in January, as a rule, and keeps at it till August. Always a beautiful song, but not always the same song. It is a clear blue message of hope, as it rings out on a cold winter's day. As the spring progresses, it becomes a cascade that overflows with bubbling sound, and ends with a challenge. Let any blackbird dare to say he can sing that cadenza as brilliantly as I can and I'll know the reason why. Later on, when the nestlings keep up a constant demand for more, he only manages to get in an occasional stanza, and that, I am inclined to think, is when he has a difference of opinion with another of his kind, though sometimes he sings a rippling, pulsating song to the setting sun. But best of all I love him when the summer has run well on into July, he is getting tired then. Two families, possibly with four in the nest at a time, are something of a handful to cater for. He has become draggled and weary in appearance. His yellow-ringed eyes do not seem as sparkling as they were. But he still tries to do his best, and toward sundown you may hear him singing. One of those in my garden seems to have a preference for an underbow on a tall pine where he stands almost hidden from sight, and whistles gently and softly, though not to me personally, as the robin does. Apparently, he is talking to himself. Gone is the buoyancy of his early spring song, gone the self-assertiveness, the boastfulness and dominating clamour of his early married life. Now his song is much subdued, gentler, and strangely suggestive, of a quiet, almost saddened reminiscence. Is it that his family have failed to come up to his expectations? Is his song tinged with regret for the lost happiness of those first glad days of spring? Or is it the reflection of the tranquillity that comes to those who bravely shouldered life's responsibility when the time came for leaving behind the things of youth? Who knows what that subdued but exquisite little song means, as it falls like a rain of soft, gentle sounds from the branches above? I cannot tell, but it stirs something strangely responsive in my own heart. I sense far back things that I cannot take hold of, or put into tangible shape, and for the moment I feel mysteriously akin to the unseen singer in the blue-green depths of the old and rugged pine. End of chapter 6 
Chapter Seven of Between the Larchwoods and the Weir. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. Between the Larchwoods and the Weir by Flora Clickman. Chapter Seven. Only small talk. I seem to have wandered a long way from Eileen but it was really she who brought the birds to my mind. I got up early the morning after our arrival, in order to show her the way about, and because it is not one of my daily duties to be the first down in the morning, I noticed all the more how the opening of the doors and windows to let in the day is something much more than the mere undoing of locks and latches. There is nothing to compare with the inrush of sweet morning air that greets you on the threshold as you take your first look out on a dew-sparkling garden probably all alive with the songs and chirps and twitters of the birds and teeming with the scent of things seen and unseen each pouring forth its gratitude in its own way for the ever-new miracle of the sun's return this letting in of light and clean air sunshine song and scent after the inanimate darkness of the night, is so wonderfully symbolic that it seems a mistake that it has come to be regarded as one of the inferior domestic tasks, relegated to the minor members of the household. And though I am not one of those exceptionally virtuous people who habitually rise at six o'clock, waking everyone else within earshot, and taking vain pride in their performances, Whenever I chance to be the first one to welcome the morning and let in the day, I feel there are decided compensations for the wrench of getting out of bed minus a cup of tea. I also realise how easy it is, in the flush of exhilaration produced by the early morning air, to make oneself a nuisance to all who are less energetic. For some unaccountable reason, when I am down extra early, I always want to bustle about and do all sorts of rackety things that never occur to me on the days when I do not put in an appearance till breakfast is ready. I had opened the windows in the living room, and had set Eileen to make the fire, and was seeing to things in the kitchen, when she followed me with an excited squawk. Oh, ma'am, somebody's lost their canary. It's on the window ledge just now, and it's flown into a tree. Have you got a bird cage handy? I expect I could catch it. There it is again, pointing to a handsome yellow and black tit who was pecking eagerly at some bacon rind I had just hung up outside the window. I explained. Wild, is he? Wild? she exclaimed. Don't they charge you nothing for them? She finished the room with one eye perpetually on the windows. Having a healthy appetite that had been touched up a little extra with the hilltop air, she was more than willing to help me get the meal ready. I made the usual preliminary inquiries as to her experience in regard to cooking, and was surprised to hear that she had actually won a silver medal at a cookery exhibition. Surely this was unexpected good fortune, and I asked myself if I really deserved such a heaven-sent boon as a silver medal cook. I decided, however, that in view of all I had undergone in the past at the hands of those who were not so decorated, it was nothing more than my due that I should be so blessed in my declining years. My only regret was that wartime would allow so little scope for her genius. Feeling very light-hearted, and wondering how she would get on with Abigail when Cook gave one of her periodical notices, and I placed Eileen on the permanent staff, I said, Then I needn't bother about the breakfast. We will have poached eggs on toast. I'll lay the cloth while you get them ready but she looked at me doubtfully. "'We didn't ever have poached eggs at the boarding-house,' she began, "'but I think I know how to do them. "'You just break them on the gridiron over the top of the fire, don't you?' After all, it was I who poached the eggs, while Eileen explained that the medal had been awarded to the cookery class at the orphanage en bloc for making a Swiss roll. No, unfortunately, she didn't know how to make Swiss roll either as she had been down with scarlet fever that term. Still, it was her class that got the medal, 
so of course she had as much right to it as any one else. I trust I bore the disappointment complacently. I'm fairly hardened to such sudden drops in the kitchen thermometer. The great thing about Eileen was her willingness, and her anxiety to learn. When I was seeking to impart knowledge, however, she seemed to think it was for her also to contribute some general information. Hence, our duologues often ran on these lines. When you make the tea or coffee, be sure that the water is quite boiling, or else... Yes, ma'am. Do you know, one of the young gentlemen where I used to live couldn't help being bald, no matter if he used a whole bottle of hair restorer every day. It ran in his family. Really? Well, now we'll fry some bacon. You put a little of the bacon fat from this jar into the pan first of all to get hot, like this. Yes, ma'am. Isn't it strange? Grandmother won't never have red roses in her bonnet. Can't bear red. She also excelled in asking questions. From morn till eve, life seemed one long series of conundrums, which I was expected to answer. I never realised before how many queries country life presents. Hitherto, it had seemed to me such a simple, straightforward state of existence. An old man had been secured to do an occasional odd day's work, at highest London prices. He described some misfortune that, last autumn, had befallen Hussy, the cow who comes for change of air into my orchard at intervals. An apple she had eaten, one of mine, of course, being blamed for the fact that her milk turned off, like vinegar twas. Eileen, in common with every other young human under twenty years of age, thrilled at the word apple, and inquired if Hussy had stolen it off a tree. "'Stolen it off a tree?' scoffed the man. "'And why should she bother to creak her neck upwards when they was lying by the thousand as thick on the ground in that there orchard as, as, well, as apples?' Eileen looked incredulous. "'Yes,' By the thousand they was, and not worth picking up. No one wanted em. No men to make cider. No sugar to jam em. Children all got colic already as bad as bad could be. Couldn't swallow no more. Too damp to keep. Aye, and we that short a cider as we be. And the aged one, who had been coining money hand over fist, with letter carrying, and the sale of eggs and poultry, and a couple of pigs, and the hay in his paddock, to say nothing of gilt-edged, easy little jobs waiting for him all about the place, at any price per hour he cared to charge, and old-age pensions paid regularly to himself and wife, paused to shake his head and sigh over the misfortunes of the times. Eileen was likewise moved, to think of it, unwanted apples, and no one to eat them, she reverted to the phenomenon several times that day, with such queries as these. If eating one apple turns the cow's milk to vinegar, would eating fifty turn it to cider? If so, wouldn't it be cheaper to make the cow grow cider, as the old man said cider had riz to seven pence a quart, and milk was only sixpence? You could then make a penny a quart profit that you could put into the savings bank to help the war. After watching some veggie cultural operations, she inquired, Why is it, when he puts potatoes in the ground, and beans in the ground, all the same way, the beans come out at the top of the plant, and the potatoes come out at the bottom? Another time it was, What do they use the sting of the nettle for? And when she had enlarged her garden vocabulary, she inquired, Is a spider an annual or a perennial? I can't find a tap out there to turn off the water. And she indicated the spring outside the gate, tumbling out of a little wooden trough wedged in among the rocks into a pool below. I suppose they stop it at the main. What time do they turn it off? Never? Runs like that always? Then how long is it before the whole lot runs away and it's all dried up? And don't they ever come down on you for wasting the water? Yet more accomplished people than Eileen have often surprised one by their ignorance. 
an experienced and supposed to be highly qualified cook came to me one day with the sad news that we couldn't have any stuffing with the duck for dinner that day as there wasn't a single bottle of herbs in the house i reminded her that there was an almost unlimited amount of everything in the garden including a sage bush growing on a wall that now measures fifteen feet by six feet in the garden she repeated in surprise but i didn't know it was good unless it was bottled you don't mean that country people use those things raw i felt such an apologetic cannibal as i explained she it was who split up the chopping board to light the fire the first morning after her arrival because she couldn't find a bundle of firewood anywhere on being referred to the stack of dry kindling wood in the coal shed she had never heard of lighting fires with trees before never thought indeed to live with a family that expected you to do such things on one occasion when i was in one of the largest and poorest of the london elementary schools where the children looked as pitifully sordid and poverty-stricken as i have ever seen them i asked a few questions of one small girl in the front row of a class her outside dress consisted of an old dilapidated waistcoat worn over a dingy flannelette nightgown while a ragged piece of serge fastened around the waist with a safety pin did duty for a skirt but she was only one among a class full of rags and tatters what is your name i asked by way of starting conversation victorine the forlorn-looking little thing replied and what is your lesson about i then inquired they're derophilicoracal she informed me seeing the bewildered look on my face the headmistress who was showing me round said enunciate your words more carefully victorine and speak slowly victorine understood what speak slowly meant and so she said very deliberately the delphic coracle oh so you are learning about the delphic oracle and what are you going to do when you grow up was my next query i'm going to work in the laundry like mother we went into another classroom here more ragged unwashed clothes greeted me on every hand i had no need to ask the subject of the lesson for the girls were facing a blackboard on which was written the characteristics of shelley's poetry after i had seen more tatters in a third room where a lesson was being given on infinitive verbs i said to the headmistress if i had this school do you know what i should do i should take a class at a time and give out needles and cotton and tell them to do the best they could to sew up the rags in their dresses and their pinafores i would not mind if they did not put on patches even to a thread in the regulation way so long as they made some attempt to run together those rents and slits and yawning gaps i would let the other lessons go till this was done and i would not let a girl take her place in a class in the morning till she had mended as well as she could any rents she had worn to school the headmistress shook her head that would not be practical you see it isn't in the syllabus i don't pretend to understand the inwardness of syllabuses but i couldn't help wondering if there wasn't an opening here for a new one while so much unpractical stuff is taught to the poorer classes in elementary schools is it any wonder that the children know so little of the things appertaining to daily life eileen didn't exactly suffer from rags she was as neat and patched and wholesome as her clean sensible grandmother could make her but she was forlorn looking to the last degree one of the first things i tried to do was to get her to take a little pride in her personal appearance and it was wonderful how she responded with her hair released from the uncompromising tight screw that had been kept in place by three big iron-looking hairpins and done higher up and more loosely over the forehead and a pretty collar and blue bow for her sunday blouse she looked a different being poor little thing she has never had a soul to take any interest in how she looks ursula remarked to me and even though we are not allowed to cast our bread upon the waters nowadays 
They haven't said anything officially about ribbons. And so we searched our drawers for suitable finery that might bring a little colour into Eileen's hitherto drab outlook. Virginia followed suit, remarking that she liked to scatter little seeds of kindness by the wayside, since you never know what may result. True, she didn't. Meanwhile, Eileen gloated over the odds and ends, fixing weird and crazy-looking bows to her black sailor hat, draping her shoulders with bits of lace to see if they would make a collar, and standing in front of the kitchen glass, trying the effects of pinks and purples under her chin. For a time, the question ceased. End of chapter 7 Chapter Eight of Between the Larch Woods and the Weir. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathleen. Between the Larch Woods and the Weir by Flora Glickman. Chapter Eight. Cold Snap. For a couple of days, the sun was radiant and the air actually warm we agreed with each other that italy and the south of france weren't in it we decided gardening with all the zest of backwoods women who know that the only vegetables they can hope for are those they themselves grow unlike the majority of londoners the war had not added much to our knowledge in this direction i had not owned a house in the country for many months before i learnt the value of first-hand home production hence when the allotment fever set in we were quite able to keep pace with the rest of the world despite our failing intellects the only thing that differentiated us from the remainder of our fellow-citizens in the metropolis was the fact that we appeared to be the only ones who did not feel themselves competent to bestow unlimited information and advice in season and out of season to all and sundry on every imaginable and unimaginable point connected with the raising of food crops one of the many reasons for the charm that envelops our life at the hillside cottage lies in the fact that it brings us much closer to the fundamental principle of keeping alive than is ever possible in town with its over civilization of course it isn't desirable that our mental and spiritual interests should centre in the question of what we shall eat and what we shall drink and wherewithal shall we keep warm and comfortable but i think a woman suffers a distinct loss when she eliminates these matters entirely from her horizon i know from personal experience that there comes a period in our lives when we women feel that there are much higher enterprises beckoning us that we individually not collectively are called to do some work in the world that is far greater than seeing to meals and keeping the household machinery moving unobtrusively and with regularity but it is fortunate that there eventually returns to us if we are properly balanced a realization that some of our very best work can be put into the making of a home and that far from it being narrow and sordid and selfish to devote a large part of ourselves to household administration it is in reality one of the widest spheres that a woman can choose and one that will give her the biggest scope for bringing happiness and strength and health to others and after all isn't that the avowed aim of the most advanced of modern feminists still i admit that our cramped surroundings and jaded strained existence in cities do not always make a round of domestic duties seem alluring to the woman who has to cram her belongings and her aspirations into a small modern flat or who has to do her cooking in one of the unhealthy sunless basements that prevail in the older houses in towns a woman needs fresh air sunshine and a garden if the best is to be brought out of her oh yes i know some women have done great things without one or another of these items but probably they would have done still more if they had had the opportunity to come to their full development under more favourable circumstances i am not surprised that women whose existence is limited by the narrow environment of towns 
so continually beat the air with a longing to do something more than seems possible in the flat or dull suburban villa civilization has taken out of their hands so many of the useful occupations that formerly kept women busy and worthily busy too and it is not to be wondered at that they cry out for something to do and invent causes on which to expend their zeal and energy the preparation of food the laundry work and indeed most household duties are now done for us in cities on the penny in the slot principle only we have to put a shilling in the slot as a rule for the penny worth of result that we receive and it is small wonder that so few of us can work up any interest in the process but how are matters to be altered you ask me i don't know pray don't think i'm proposing to find solutions for grave problems in these stories i'm only giving you a record of facts just simple everyday little happenings of no value to any one save the owner and we'll leave it at that if you don't mind and return to the garden before the war labor was not so scarce and there was no need for us to plant the vegetables ourselves unless we desired to do so now however one's own personal work was a valuable asset and we put our backs into it at least ursula and i did virginia was engaged most of the time in describing the sort of tools she would make if she were in that line of business to obviate the grave spinal trouble she was certain she was developing i don't mean to imply that virginia isn't a good gardener she can be an excellent one when she likes for she knows what gardening really stands for in the way of hard work whereas some of my would-be assistant gardeners seem to think the chief requisites are a comfortable hammock and a book or at most a pitcher muslin frock and a pretty basket and a pair of baby scissors such girls remind me of many who write and inquire if i have a vacancy for a sub-editor in my office the chief qualification stated in their letters being that they do so love to browse among books virginia isn't like that she puts on a business-like garb and knows and annexes a good tool when she sees it but it is her bright ideas that are the hindrance to progress she wasted ten minutes that morning explaining to me that she was sure if i would only have turnips planted in the mint bed it would be another war economy as the mint flavor might permeate the turnips and thus save double expense with lamb and then another ten minutes went in enlarging on the grasping nature of the makers of gardening gloves in not supplying four pairs of extra thumbs with each pair since any intelligent gardener could wear out eight thumbs with one pair in the simplest day's gardening she offered to let me use the idea free of charge in my magazine if i would undertake to keep her supplied with gardening gloves for the rest of her natural life but she stipulated that they must be proper leather ones not the four and sixpenny war variety she was then wearing composed of unbleached calico with merely a chamois postage stamp stuck on the front of each finger and thumb in the intervals of conversation she aided us with our digging yet in spite of the national call to spend as much on seed potatoes as would keep the family in vegetables for a couple of years we continually found ourselves drifting away from the ground we were trenching for the violets were already out also some early primroses and little white stars were showing on the wild strawberry trails in sheltered corners under walls that faced south and the garden is full of sheltered nooks despite its being so high up as the ground slopes towards the south every wall that props up the garden and there are so many like giant steps down the steep hillside gives protection from the cold winds to the little growing things that nestle in every crevice and on the ground below everywhere the penny wart was sending out clear green discs from the mysterious depths of crannies in the wall crocuses were showing orange buds in the garden beds one precocious pansy held up a white flower streaked and splashed with purple spring has really come we all chorused and oh how good it seemed to be done with the winter such a winter too surely the longest and most awful winter humanity has ever known 
with spring and summer immediately before us as it seemed we decided to leave the trenching just for that day and explore the lanes and woods the lichens and mosses were at the height of their beauty a beauty that would fade once the sun got any power the wall stones were splashed with browns and greys rust colour and orange black and olive and one particular lichen that is our especial joy tints the stone a milky pea-green shade that is unlike any other colour i can recall last year's bramble leaves were purple and scarlet and crimson and yellow where the small ivy creeping up the walls had been touched by the frost it had turned a vivid yellow mottled with warm brown and crimson and it is surprising once you take note of it how much crimson is used by nature where you would expect to find only green and not merely a dull red it is a brilliant vivid carmine that is dropped about in quiet unsuspected places lighting up dark patches emphasizing sombre details that one might otherwise overlook we were turning over a handful of brown leaves under an oak tree in the wood there we found the streak of crimson showing inside an acorn that had just burst to let out a young shoot that was seeking about for root hold below and light up above not only one but hundreds of similar brilliant touches were scattered about where the fertile acorns lay among the moss and last year's fern in one secluded spot where the cold had not been severe enough to wither last year's foliage on the undergrowth long sprays of ground ivy climbing over a fallen branch had turned to deep wine colour stems and all and lay as eileen said beautiful enough for one of them lovely wreaths of leaves they put round best hats certainly it looked more artificial than natural if one didn't happen to know that ground ivy often takes on this tint in its declining days thanks to tennyson we all know that rosy plumelets tuff the larch but it doesn't matter how many times you see them they are always worth looking at and marvelling at again and there seems no limit to the crimson splashes is there anything anywhere that can compare with the herb robert its leaves far more radiant than its blossoms or the leaves of the evening primrose when they start to fade at the bottom of the stem or the wanting foliage of the sorrel to make a list of the crimson touches as distinct from the reddish brown that one finds on stems and foliage any day in the country would be a revelation to most of us though the sun had been so bright when we started it doesn't do to trust too much in an english spring and we presently noticed a very decided change the temperature dropped with great rapidity as clouds came up and hid the sun and the hills that towered about us suddenly loomed gloomy and forbidding the wind veered round from southwest to northeast and by evening it was piercingly bitterly cold taking a last look round with the lantern before we locked up for the night not a sound could be heard everything was absolutely still with that unearthly silence of a land suddenly gripped by overpowering cold i glanced at the thermometer hanging on the outside wall it already registered three degrees below freezing it would probably be ten before morning we bolted the door and shut out the cold hoping no one was wandering lost on the hills that night not that any one ever is but it is pleasant to have kind charitable thoughts like that on a bleak night as you put yet another log on the fire next morning as it was colder and more perishing than ever i decided to cope with several days arrears of office work piling itself up in all directions virginia said it was just as well the weather necessitated our remaining indoors as she could now get on with her work of course we asked what work she informed us that she was engaged upon an anthology shakespeare and the great war she felt that shakespeare and everything else had been done pretty thoroughly by less competent people than herself it is true but all the same 
the poet had been dealt with exhaustively from every point of view but that of the war also the war had been dealt with in extenso from every point of view but shakespeare's hence her present literary effort and would i kindly give her any quotations i could think of that had any bearing on this world crisis all my brain was equal to was tell me where is fancy bread which undoubtedly indicated that the war loaf was known to pall on the public taste even in shakespeare's time she said she had expected me to say that it was so obvious nevertheless i noticed she hurriedly jotted it down we asked her to read her m s so far as she had gone it seemed a pity for us to overlap i've made a fair start she explained but the trouble is they all turn out so awkwardly for instance the first quotation i have down is she riseth also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household any one can see daylight saving there naturally i opened my mouth to speak but she cut me short testily of course i know as well as you that it isn't shakespeare at least i wasn't reared a heathen but that's just the tiresome part of it every quotation i think of isn't shakespeare at all here's another that would do beautifully and take up a nice bit of space on the page too the upper air burst into life and a hundred fire flags sheen to and fro they were hurried about and to and fro and in and out the wan stars danced between even a child could tell that they were the searchlights trying to spot a zepp only it isn't shakespeare it's very worrying yet i know if only i could get the book done there would be a fortune in it w s always sells and he's so respectable too i said i was sorry my office duties had prior claim on my time and i urged ursula to do her sisterly part but she said she couldn't be bothered just then her mind was more than fully occupied in trying to lay the blame for everything on the right person so i took virginia's m s and read it down how full of briars is this working day world this proves that barbed wire entanglements were known in the seventeenth century how far that little candle throws his beams this indicates clearly that shakespeare was fined for failing to comply with the lighting restrictions that he was compelled to pay war profits out of the royalties on his plays is evidenced by these poignant words in macbeth knots had all's spent and doubtless there was a subtle reference to war taxation in age cannot wither nor custom stale her infinite variety the unfailing hold of shakespeare on humanity is the fact that he touched upon all phases of life this sentence was virginia's own literary contribution to the anthology for example she went on even a sugar shortage was known in his day to what else could he have been referring when he wrote sweet are the uses of adversity and can any one doubt that double double toil and trouble fire burn and cauldron bubble points to meatless days here we are interrupted by a knock at the door it was miss primkins an elderly lady who lives by herself or at least with rehoboam her cat in a pretty little cottage further down the hill miss primkins has been hard hit by the war but no matter how she has to skimp and save in other ways she never relaxes her work for the wounded and it was about her contribution to queen mary's needlework guild that she came up to consult me not that we started there straight away of course not we talked about the shortage of sugar and the high cost of boots and the scarcity of chicken food and the price of meat and the difficulty of knowing how to feed rehoboam adequately and yet in strict accordance with official regulations and the color of the bread and what are we coming to and other topical matters like that then when i had pressed miss primkins several times to stay to our midday meal and she had as many times assured me that she must not stay another minute grateful though she was for my kind invitation as she had put on the potatoes to boil before she came out she produced in an undertone a paper parcel from her bag 
and with much hesitation explained that she wanted advice on a private matter i was all attention undoing the paper she displayed what looked like a round bolster case made of pink and blue striped flannelette as she held it up for inspection it flared at the top to use a dressmaker's term with merely a small round opening at the bottom i glanced it over as intelligently as i knew how and then inquired what it was it's a pajama for a soldier she murmured modestly in a very low voice i've cut it exactly by the paper pattern yet miss judson who saw it yesterday says she doesn't believe it's right we've neither of us ever made one before so i thought i would run up to you with it you would be sure to know er hm ah uh, yes i said as light dawned it's all right so far as it goes but where's the other leg the other leg she echoed there was only one in the pattern of course but you should have cut it out in double material the garment requires two legs you know does it she exclaimed in genuine surprise why i thought it must be intended for a soldier who had had his other leg amputated before virginia put away her anthology preparatory to having lunch she added another quotation to her list for never anything can be amiss when simpleness and duty tender it and against this she scribbled one-legged pajama doubtless for elucidation and amplification at a later date i hope i haven't forestalled her end of chapter eight chapter nine of between the larch woods and the weir this is a LibriVox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by kathleen between the larch woods and the weir by flora glickman chapter nine snowdrifts it was later in the day and the zest for shakespeare had waned virginia had moved from beside the fire and was sitting nearer the window in order to get what light there was from the sun just disappearing behind the opposite hills she was very busy with some crochet edging she had lately started it was the first time within the memory of living woman that virginia had been seen with a crochet hook in her hand fancy work had never been her strong point hence the inordinate pride with which she patted out the short fragment on any available surface at frequent intervals surveying it from different points of view with her head cricked at various angles and calling upon all and sundry to admire after moving nearer the window she again patted out the seven small scallops on her knee as usual and then became meditative no one paid much attention to her however i was sitting on the settle with a heaped-up table before me absorbed in m s s which i was reading and then sorting into various piles for printer for reserve for return and arranging these on the seat beside me important work which accounted for my preoccupation ursula was busily engaged in the laudable endeavor to construct a pair of child's knickers out of two pairs of stocking legs some one had told her this could be done it had appealed to her as a serviceable way to use up done with stockings and she assured me the problem of what to do with these done withs had been a long-standing mental burden while at the same time one might be conferring a benefit upon the poor the fact that the modern poor would have scorned anything so economical did not worry her at last virginia broke the silence it's really quite remarkable i don't know that i've met with a more extraordinary crochet pattern than this she said thoughtfully where did you get it from i asked rather absently as i went on with my work from one of the magazines you are supposed to edit she said blandly what is there extraordinary about it i inquired now thoroughly roused up to give the matter all my attention while ursula laid down the dislocated stocking leg she had been wrestling with well it's like this there is the pattern you see pointing to a picture i had seen before and there are the directions when you've worked them through once that makes one scallop do you see 
we said we saw it quite plainly then you notice it says at the very end go back and repeat from the first row now this is the extraordinary part of the affair every time i go back and repeat from the first row it makes an entirely different scallop the last time but one you see the scallop came on the opposite side of the sewing on edge i thought that was interesting enough but now i find this last scallop has turned a corner funny isn't it for the first time we gave virginia's bit of edging serious attention what she had done with those directions it was impossible to say but the result was certainly peculiar that will be a valuable piece of lace by the time it's finished i said what are you going to do with it i'm making it as a christmas present for you she replied sweetly i think it will help to promote conversation if you display it at your social functions i know you're going to say how unselfish it is of me i think myself i mellow as i age not at all i replied politely and suggested that we should go for a walk lest such concentrated thinking should be too much for her if you'd been a properly minded hostess you would have proposed that long ago i've been waiting anxiously for it only there is ursula absorbed in that outfit that no masculine infant anywhere would recognize oh i've given up the knicker idea long ago interrupted ursula i've turned them into chest protectors for the old in the infirmary and now as a war economy i'm going to enlarge your vests i neither ask for nor expect gratitude the laundry having shrunk them to waistbands i shall add an upper and a lower story and you sit hour after hour reading m s s what are they all about what's that one in your hand for instance this one holding up some sheets of violently written paper that almost burst through the envelope is an anonymous letter from some irate lady who objects to something or someone appearing in our pages i haven't time to read it but if you care to wade through it anonymous letters are so futile anything but i told her it is always a pleasant thing at the end of the day to feel that you have even in a slight way contributed to any one's happiness and i'm sure the lady who dug her pen into that anonymous letter was very happy when she posted it glad am i therefore to be the unworthy instrument permitted to promote her joy virginia merely snorted what's the next m s about this is a very long poem on the war and the writer explains that she has made all the lines run straight on in order to save paper but doubtless i can find out where it rhymes it begins hail proud mother of nations who dwell in these sea-girt islands for centuries past and centuries yet to be virginia said she'd skip the rest please and wasn't there a little light fiction anywhere in the chaos before me this is the story of a beautiful russian princess who was doomed to live in a lonely castle with no one but her aged and decrepit nurse in the very centre of a pathless siberian forest hundreds of miles from everybody until the spell should be broken what spell inquired ursula i don't know the writer doesn't say until the spell should be broken when she would be free she was the most exquisite vision that ever burst upon human sight not only were her features perfect and her hair a rippling cascade of gold but her dress was grace and beauty combined then it wasn't one of this season's models ejaculated ursula hence it must have been out of date all the same i'd like to know who was her dressmaker did they think to mention the name no that is not stated she used to spend her days listening to the wolves who congregated all around the castle howling and gnashing their horrid fangs till one day an honest sturdy forester approached and with one fell swoop slew dozens of them whereupon the princess elizabeth for such was her name opened the door and cried welcome deliverer and in less time than it takes me to tell you that aged and decrepit nurse had prepared all unaided a sumptuous wedding banquet while gorgeously apparelled guests arrived in battalions from nowhere then just as they were about to be married the honest 
sturdy forester no longer able to conceal his identity confessed that he was indeed the prince what prince inquired the interrupter again i don't know and the writer doesn't say and i wish you would remember ursula that in the larger proportion of m s s sent to editors it is customary for the writers to omit the essential details then i'd just as soon go for a walk as here any more she said with decision whereupon we got into big coats and thick gloves and tied on our hats with motor scarves i don't mean the filmy wisps one wears when motoring in the park but those large solid thick brown woolen scarves that look as though they had been made from a horse blanket the sort that the west end window dresser in desperation labels dainty but the air was bitingly cold and we were so high up among the hills that no wraps would have been too warm that day then we started off after i had said a final word to eileen about the necessity for keeping the kettle boiling as we shouldn't be gone long she had assured me many times already that she wasn't the least bit nervous about being left alone rather liked it in fact she was blissfully engaged at the moment in trying to construct a dainty evening camisole as per some penny weekly she had bought coming down out of the satin ribbon and lace from virginia's last year's hat the small white dog with the brown ears accompanied us to the gate but decided that with the thermometer just where it was at that moment home-keeping hearts were happiest so he promptly returned to the hearth rug the sun had disappeared but there was still light on the hilltops though the valley below was fast settling down to darkness virginia suggested the lantern but i thought we should not need it more especially as the moon was due immediately so we set off at a swinging pace already owing to the severity of the frost the roads rang like iron to our tread every stalk and twig was glistening with rime and feathered with hoar frost no sign of life did we see in all that walk where were the birds and squirrels and rabbits and pheasants and all the hundreds of timid wild things we were accustomed to meet on our summer rambles we hoped they were safely tucked away in barns or burrows or sleeping in warm hay ricks for nothing else above ground would give them any shelter i thought of the row of twittering swallows that always perched themselves along the ridge of the cottage roof on hot summer afternoons and felt glad they had gone off to a warmer climate but for ourselves we would not have exchanged the weather that moment for any other no matter how balmy there is something remarkably exhilarating in the clear cold air of such a day on the hilltops and as we mounted up and up our spirits rose with us even though the roads were rough and terribly hard on wartime leather i once remarked to a local resident that i found our stony hillside roads a bit trying to say nothing of the side paths well now i do be surprised to hear e a say that he replied for the only time i were up to lunnon i went for a day scursion do you know my legs did that hake when i got back i were a week getting over it it were all along oh they flat stones what they do have up there why if you believe me i was a near toppling over every other minute there weren't near a blessed thing to catch hold onter with your toes i felt as though the pavement was a coming up to knock my head now on these here roads oh orn you can't slip far because there's always some at of a rock or big stone to trip up again for myself however i sometimes think i would prefer the said rocks and stones if they were boiled a bit and then mangled at last we reached the crest of the hill and paused to get our breath the silence was awe-inspiring at all other times there is a persistent hum of insects or cheep of birds or the rustling of leaves and swaying grasses movement and sound somewhere night as well as day but when the earth has been swept by the magic of frost then there is silence indeed from where we stood we might have been alone on the very edge of the world no house was visible and although we knew that the little village lay in the valley below us we could see nothing of it 
all was gray merging into indigo in the depths of the coombs gray were the trees on the farther hills gray unrelieved by the lights and shadows that gaily chase each other over the steeps in sunny weather as the white clouds sail across the sky above them near at hand the trees took on more individuality the straight columns of the larches were mysterious-looking and awe-inspiring suggesting regiments of soldiers suddenly called to a halt pale gray beeches that in damp weather show a vivid emerald green down the north side of their huge trunks where moss flourishes undisturbed were now stretching out strong bare arms over the carpet of many years leaves lying thickly beneath them silver birch stems gleamed in contrast to the glossy dark green of innumerable aged yews that dotted the woods ancient inhabitants indeed standing hoary and heroic like some dark visaged guardians of the forest among a host of newcomers of a far younger generation but while we were standing there a sound suddenly broke the stillness a sound i have heard hundreds of times on those hills yet never without an eerie feeling it begins far away a low undertone murmur gradually it comes nearer and nearer getting louder and louder till it becomes almost a roar and then diminuendo it passes on and is finally lost in the far distance it is only the wind as it suddenly rushes through the river gorge but as it tears at the forests on the hillsides and lashes the branches together it produces a strangely uncanny sound more especially when the trees are bare and extremely vibrant hearing this one can understand the origin of the old-time legends about headless horsemen galloping past on windy nights and similar hair-raising stories as a child when i often visited at another house in this region for four generations of us have climbed these hills and explored the valleys i heard these same headless horsemen gallop along the slopes on many stormy nights and despite my years and my common sense i still feel the same creepy shiver in the back of my neck when they have a particularly mad stampede past my cottage door for then they always pause to give the weirdest of howls through the keyholes how dark it is getting exclaimed ursula where is your moon and just hear the wind coming up the valley it had not reached us as yet but the words had scarcely left her lips before it came swish full upon us we had to grip each other and plant our walking sticks firmly on the ground to keep our feet and then we knew what the sudden change meant for next moment down came the snow snow which as the town dweller knows nothing about for in cities where there are buildings to break the force of the elements but on these heights there is nothing to impede the fury of the storm as it gallops over the upper regions crashing and smashing as it goes the snow dashed in our eyes it got inside our coat collars it clogged up our hair it swirled and drove as they say locally till it made our heads dizzy and our eyes smarted with trying to see through the whirling mass owing to our exposed position we felt the full force of the storm and it was difficult matter to make headway in the blinding flakes and stinging wind there is a short cut through the wood further along the road let us get home as soon as we can i said leading the way and we staggered on against the blizzard till we came to the wood and plunged from the road into its recesses but i soon found it is one thing to know the way through a dense mass of trees in bright sunshine with a path clearly defined and quite another thing to find one's way in the twilight with a gale blowing in one's teeth and every landmark obliterated by the rapidly falling snow we stumbled along for some time over the rough stones and great boulders lovely enough in summer with their coverings of ivy moss and fern but very painful and cold for the shins when you tumble over them in the snow before long it was quite evident to me that we were merely wandering at large among the trees and scrambling among the undergrowth of stalks and bracken our hats catching in the hanging branches our skirts being clutched at by the all-pervading bramble path there was none i had to admit i had lost my bearings 
though as we were going steadily downhill i knew we should arrive at the other side presently as downhill was our destination what little conversation we indulged in beyond the usual exclamations every time we tripped over something had to be done in shouts so high was the wind in this way we tumbled on for about half an hour just as virginia was confiding to me fortissimo above the blizzard how she wished she had been nicer to her family when she had the opportunity and how sweet and forgiving she would have been to them all had she but known that i was going to take her out to an arctic grave the snow ceased the clouds broke the moon appeared and at the same time we cleared the wood and struck a familiar lane a gag's path we had named it on account of the need for walking delicately by way of keeping up our spirits ursula began to chant to some lilting sprightly tune that most lugubrious poem lucy gray the storm came up before its time she wandered up and down and many a hill did lucy climb but never reached the town when she got to the verse they followed from the snowy bank those footmarks one by one into the middle of the plank and farther there were none virginia exclaimed for mercy's sake if you must wail do wail something cheerful and lively the boy stood on the burning deck for instance would warm one up a bit instead of that other shivery thing by the time we reached our gate the storm was over though the wind was still sweeping restlessly over the hills a dog belonging to a neighboring farmer jumped over the garden wall he had evidently called in the hope of getting a chance to settle a long-standing score he had against my own innocent-looking animal who was ever a terrible fighter we paid no attention to the dog however but hurried up the path only too thankful to see the lights of home and glad that eileen had forgotten to pull down the dark blinds nevertheless i wondered that she did not open the door so soon as she heard the gate i put my hand on the latch but to my surprise the door was locked i rattled the latch and knocked the dog whined inside and gave impatient little short barks which always mean a summons to someone to open the door and let me in but the door remained locked then eileen's voice within are you quite by yourselves has the wolf gone open the door at once and don't talk nonsense i said firmly trying not to sound as irritated as i felt oh but it isn't nonsense i've seen them out there one was there just now and i'm not going to risk my life by opening the door if he's there still evidently our lives were unimportant if you don't open the door this very instant i said i'll get in through the window you must be out of your senses and you have always professed to be so brave the key grated in the lock and the door opened half an inch while eileen's nose peeped at the crack to make sure we were not the wolf then she explained if you'd been here for hours and hours as i have we had actually been gone an hour and a half though i could understand the sudden storm and our delay had made her nervous hearing those wolves outside a howling and howling and gnashing their horrid fangs you wouldn't wonder i was afraid to open the door i saw one skulking off just before you came in i understood the situation immediately eileen i said severely what have you been reading i couldn't help just seeing what it was all about when i spread the sheets on the dresser you said i must have fresh papers for the dresser and shelves fresh paper on the dresser i exclaimed and went hurriedly into the kitchen sure enough the dresser the pantry and scullery shelves and all other available surfaces including the deep window sill and the tops of the safes had been carefully covered with white paper prompt investigation proved them to be pages from some of the various m s s i had left in piles on the settle when i went out of course the writing was face downwards i lifted things and examined what was beneath the vegetable dishes on the dresser were reposing on portions of a cereal story canisters salt box and biscuit tins shared the back of one of a series of nature study articles the siberian wolves were gnashing their horrid fangs beneath the knife machine 
i left the anonymous letter to an amiable if inglorious end laid along the saucepan shelf but i hurriedly collected the rest to the accompaniment of eileen's plaintive tones i thought you had put them there for waste paper and the back of every sheet was so beautifully clean and i had made my kitchen look so nice with them all of which goes to illustrate the risk one runs in sending m s s to editors more especially to feminine editors possessed of kitchens though the fall of snow did not last very long the wind howled and moaned around the house all the evening and roared in the wide chimneys like a thirty-two feet open diapason pedal pipe virginia suggested to eileen that she should go out and put a little salt on the wolves tails to see if that would quiet them i thoroughly enjoy the moaning of the wind if i am surrounded by creature comforts a big fire a good cup of tea or something interesting in that line i never feel a desire for intellectual or introspective pursuits when the moan is most robust when a raw nor'wester or a bullying sou'wester howls outside the door and windows making the pine trees creak and groan like the wheels of an old timber wagon and the evergreen firs wildly wave their branches like long dark plumes i want to be able to hug myself to myself in the midst of warmth and good cheer and in the company of some congenial fellow-being then i give the fire a further poke and another log remarking contentedly just hark at that wind what a night isn't it cosy indoors and the brass candlesticks on the mantelpiece and the plates and jugs and dishes on the dresser blink acquiescence under such circumstances i love the howlers on these hills but if i were a studious ascetic burning the midnight oil and very little else i am afraid that the sound of the wailing up and down the scale in minor sixths coupled with the lack of comforting food and blazing fire and sympathetic companionship would make me desperately melancholy indeed now we were indoors we could defy the weather and here at least firewood was plentiful not the five sticks a penny take it or leave it that had been our portion in town but as much as ever one wanted and plenty more where the last came from we soon had crackling blazes all over the house and you should have seen eileen's almost awestruck countenance when she was told to make herself a fire in her own bedroom now i know what it's like to be the queen she exclaimed i had been literally fire starved owing to the need for economizing on fuel in town and now i was loose among my own woods again with snapped branches lying in all directions among the undergrowth i went in for an orgy of warmth large chunks of apple wood and stubby bits the wind had tossed down from the creaking fir trees made crackling glowing fires in the big open grates an absurd butterfly unthawed itself from some crevice among the ceiling beams and came walking deliberately down the window curtain evidently under the impression that he was in for a sultry summer for some time we sat and watched the slender of it all when you are burning logs from old sea-going ships you see again the blue and saffron of the sky and the green and the peacock tents of the ocean and in like manner you can see leaping from our forest logs the crimson and yellow and gold that once blazed in the autumn glory of the tree-covered hills and the glow of the fire gives back the warmth and the sunshine that the trees caught in their leaves and cherished in their rugged branches i dropped off to sleep that night with the flickering fire glow whispering of comfort and rest for body and brain yes despite the soothing balm of it all and the certainty of safety from the terror that walks by night so that one could sleep without that sense of constant listening that has become second nature with those of us who live in town i could not enjoy it with the old-time zest who could with the thought ever on one's heart what about this lad and that one where are they lying this bitter night physical sense becomes numbed when one lives perpetually in the shadow of possible tragedy probably it was the after effect of our struggle with the wind and weather that caused us all to sleep very soundly that night at any rate 
it was broad daylight before anyone stirred in the cottage next morning and we missed the doings of the storm king in the interval when i first opened my eyes i wondered what the white light could be that was reflected on the ceiling then i looked out of the window and what a scene it was the whole earth so far as the eye could see was one vast fairyland of snow moreover the face of creation appeared to have risen three or four feet nearer the bedroom window since last i had looked out though the full import of this did not occur to me at the moment i could merely look and look at the wonderful transformation that had been effected so rapidly and so silently while we slept all trace of the garden had disappeared shrubs and trees alike were bowed down with billows of snow in the more exposed places the wind had blown some of the snow from the firs and larches but for the most part the trees on the hillside were as laden with snow as those in the garden we might have been high up in the alps the sun was trying to shine and bringing a gleam and glint out of every snow crystal but the sky still looked leaden in the north eileen bringing the morning tea imparted the thrilling intelligence that the snow was several feet deep outside the doors the outhouses inaccessible then we must clear the snow from the path ourselves i said there is nothing else for it the handy man was laid up with influenza in his home several fields away and there was small likelihood of any other man coming our way but the question of a few shovels of snow did not seem a serious matter we were quite light-hearted about it when we made our first survey of the situation however we found that the snow was far higher outside the door than we had at first imagined owing to the position of the house and the way it nestles back in a little hollow that has been cut out of the hillside to give it level standing room special inducement had been offered to the snow to pile itself up in drifts and block each door in a most effectual manner still that snow had to be cleared away somehow and we stood in the doorway and discussed methods hitherto i had always held the idea that people who allowed themselves to remain snowed up were very dull-witted and lacking in enterprise why not start clearing from the inside beginning with the spadeful nearest the doorstep and so go on clearing space after space until they had got through to the outer world to me it seemed quite an easy thing to do if you went about it systematically but one slight detail had never occurred to me namely what should be done with the first spadeful of snow when you shoveled it up from beside the doorstep to say nothing of the next and the next that was one of the questions that bothered us now though it was not the first difficulty we encountered at the very outset of course we all said just get a spade but alas the spade was locked up in one of the inaccessible outhouses next we called for a broom but all brooms were in the same building then i said well bring some shovels here's the kitchen shovel said eileen ursula pounced on that at once and here's the scoop from the coal scuttle and here's one of the small brass shovels from upstairs but where's the big iron shovel i asked that's in the coal shed likewise inaccessible virginia turned a deaf ear on the bedroom shovel and possessed herself of the scoop i had no alternative but to start work with the small brass affair that was about as effective as a fish slice would have been we each shoveled up a mass most of it tumbling off the shovel again before we got it into mid-air and then we looked at each other and inquired what we were to do with it it did not seem advisable to carry it inside the house and the only alternative was to toss it a foot or two away from us but then that only meant adding to the pile already there which in any case we should have to clear away before we could get anywhere it was a problem in the end we managed to clear about a square foot and make a few small burrows in the mound around us by throwing the snow as far away as we could each time but what was that foot we were still yards away from the coal shed and the wood house with only a limited supply indoors and still further away from the water we had been working for a solid hour and seemed to have raised a haystack of snow a little way off where we had tossed our meagre shovelfuls and then 
as though to mock our feeble attempts down came the snow again and covered up the space we had cleared with such effort we looked at it in absolute despair why was i born an unmarried spinster exclaimed ursula oh that a man would hove in sight or whatever the present tense of hove may be but no man obligingly hove in response End of chapter nine